Welcome to Give a Heck. I am your host, Dwight Heck, and for much of my life, lived my life in quiet desperation, wondering how I was going to pay the bills, take vacations, save for retirement, and one day wondering if I would get off the hamster wheel of life and have purpose. A life that most of society lives, which takes us to work, then home, then repeat, and pays us hopefully enough just to survive. The harsh truth that most live with more months than money and have no idea how to live life on purpose, not by accident. This ensures the mass majority are living not just financially broke, however emotionally and mentally as well due to financial pressures. In each episode, I will introduce you to thoughts, ideas, and guests that can help you to learn how you too can live life on purpose, not by accident. Good day and welcome to Give a Heck. On today's show, I welcome Sarah Jane. As a busy wife, mom of three, and a business owner, Sarah knows how stressful life can be. After battling anxiety and losing her dad, she reevaluated everything so she could maximize her life and discovered that we all can turn things around. Sarah has always been more natural minded, but a panic attack in 2015 sent her in a tailspin. She knew she needed drastic change, so set out to transform her life. You can have more energy and a life full of all the extra you were made for. Sarah has been on a mission ever since to help people live their best lives, including in 2020, launching her podcast, Fast Lane with Sarah Jane. As a doctor of chiropractic and wellness advocate, Sarah has helped thousands of others get back on their feet the same way she was able to do for herself through better nutrition, cleaner products, and a mastered mindset. Sarah's goal, the end result she's wanting for others is to help them stop beating themselves up and create a lifestyle that puts them back on the top of their game. I'd like to welcome you to the show, Sarah. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and share with us some of your life journey. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and chat with you. Yeah, this is going to be a fantastic conversation. So Sarah, one of the things we talked about prior to um, hitting record is my own, the way I do my podcast. And I focus on somebody's origin story because I think the good, bad and ugly from the time of our earliest recollections is important for people to understand who we are and why we are where we currently are at. So can you do me a favor and tell me what key things from your childhood to adulthood that led you to where you're at currently? I grew up in a small town and I currently live in the same small town that I grew up in. And sometimes I think that's a blessing and I think it's a curse because when you grow up in a small town, you know everyone. So you know who's going for coffee, you know who's going to play pinochle, you know, you expect to see the same people every day getting the mail. And the blessing part of that is that you have the community. So you grow up in the community and you know everyone and now you come back to the community and you have your own children and you still have, you know, some of the same people. So I think that the values I got growing up in a small community I continue to have, and I'm able to pass them on to my children, even though, you know, I know that's a slippery slope because time does so many things and it it can't be the childhood just like mine, but it was good to live, you know, in the eighties, early nineties, because you could go to the pool and you could go to the park and you could be involved in everything. And again, I think that sense of community and involvement really helped shape who I am. Yeah, the, I grew up in the, in the, you know, I was a teenager in the 80s, and I get it. There was a total different time. We weren't controlled by, you know, our electronic devices. We didn't have electronic devices. We were lucky if we had a little tape recorder that we could carry around. I was still listening to albums back in the early 80s, and then you got into cassette tapes and all that stuff. But we didn't have all the disconnection from people like today's adults have and children have so I agree I grew I grew up in a small community of like 10,000 people so I don't know how small your community is but I get it the 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 only issue is it was like you said everybody knows what you're doing everybody has a say in what you're doing because even if you don't want their opinion they feel obligated to give it to you (laughs) (laughs) right and so we have a town our community is 1200 
And I really like how you said that we didn't have the disconnect because we didn't. And it's, it's difficult now because you see the disconnect in so many different things. So, you know, like let's say a patient will come in, I have a younger patient and trying to get them to sometimes have a conversation is painful because I will lead with, so anything exciting going on for the week? No. Okay, you know, like you, I will try to make conversation because you try to make a connection because A, mundane conversation is boring for me. And it's not that I need to be entertained all the time, but if you and I are in a room or you and I are having coffee, or if you're my patient, we should be able to have some type of interaction or some type of connection on, on some level. So that's a really good point. There's a lot of disconnect right now, which I find very sad. Yeah. I wonder sometimes if we have conversations, if we meet up with people and handed them a device and then messaged them, <laughs> if we'd get a better result. Um, it's, yeah. It, well, and it's not even, I don't even want to pick on the younger generations. I think it's really unfair of people to do that. I see people in their 40s and 50s with their face buried in a tablet or a smart device, like a smartphone or whatever, and just completely disconnected. It's, I think the art of conversation has been lost a long time mm -hmm. ago. And that it's up to people like ourselves to put our foot down really and say, you know what, this isn't this isn't uh, the way that life needs to be. We need to have a conversation. And the only problem with that on the flip side of that is you can have children like mine that I've worked on. They're all adults now, but since they were younger to, you know, okay, articulate more. What are you trying to get at? You know, one word answers are not cool, right? <laughs> not unless right. I'm asking you, you know, something that deserves a yes or no answer so you know like yeah. the only problem with that is is then they talk too much and that's what i've been accused of and so are my kids <laughs> <laughs> so slippery slope what do you do it is a slippery slope it so is. what what was your so you talked about the fact of growing up in a small town and and that what were your what was your childhood like though can you be more specific what was what was sarah like what did you what were your passions what what things excited you that you think you took into being an adult? So I was, my grandma and my great aunt, they took care of me from the time I was born until I went to school. And I think that was really beneficial in the fact of they would have friends over, so I would get to have tea with the ladies. We, you know, grandma and the great aunt, everything was ironed and washed and whatever so you know there was a lot of structure in that but I think the respect thing was a huge I think that's so huge for children to be around older people because yeah it's great to be around mom and dad but when you're around especially senior citizens you do you do maybe help out a little more and I think that that is beneficial you know as a kid it was just the basic going to the pool every day and you know just playing outside and then as I got into high school and junior high uh, we had a really really good group of bass uh, girls who played basketball and when I was a fourth grader I said to the high school coach Mr. Peterson when I'm a junior and Jesse who's my cousin and Jesse's a senior we're gonna win state basketball and this was after we just had a fourth grade basketball game and he was like oh right just watch you guys play but you know it's cool that you have goals and so pretty much from the time I was a freshman uh, through my senior year five days a week we played basketball we lifted weights or worked on drills or whatever and that was the summer the summer was going to the pool and playing basketball and a lot of you know a lot of socialization with your friends um, and we did end up winning state basketball my junior year and he did bring that up uh, my sophomore year he said Sarah brought this up when she was a fourth grader and you know this should you know and it was a goal then of all of ours but that teamwork it it makes you realize that you know everyone is stronger if you have a team and what I've realized now growing up is that not necessarily is it a team that you're with every single day like we were. I now have people from all over the United States that I consider on my team because maybe we aren't having coffee or we're not going to Zumba or we're not walking every morning together, but I have found people who share common goals and interests and they help me grow as a person. So going back to 
growing up in a small town and sometimes that was it's not good for me now because I'm still little Sarah so to come to me sometimes for health advice I don't think that I'm taken as seriously because I remember you riding your bike and I remember watching you play ball and you know like people will remember all that kind of stuff instead of at this point looking at me as a professional yeah I can I, I can relate to that 100% in my own career, 19 years as a financial educator and lifestyle planner for people. I get the same thing. It was, it's been a real struggle. Um, I look at the fact of my dad is one of 18 children. My mom is one of nine children. And mm-hmm. I don't even have one tenth of 1% of any of them as clients because they always see me as my origin which is what you were just saying. So they see me as my origin, not that I was a bad kid, but I had health issues and, you know, whatever the case may be, they don't see me as the professional that I have worked so hard at to become similar to you. So I can totally relate to that. And I imagine many of the listeners or people watching this can as well. One of the things I really liked that you brought up though, was that you had structure with your, your grandma and your great aunt and everything was specifically had to be ironed and in its, you know, things in its proper place and you learn respect. One of the questions I want to ask you, what is your take on manners in today's society versus back then? I'm going to take, I needed to take a big sigh there because I have three boys and I homeschool them. So the youngest still goes to daycare, but I have the older two with me. And I try so hard to make sure they are respectful and, you know, structure is good, but too much structure is probably not good for a kid, right? Because you you need to have some playtime. And it's frustrating because people will tell me, oh, you have the nicest kids. They're so polite and so respectful and whatever. And as a parent, that just makes your heart just shine, right? You're just, oh, I'm doing such a good job. And then they come home and it's like, who did you leave that other person? You know, like, where have you been? And it's so frustrating because I try not to hold them to a different standard here versus when they're out in public. But I'm glad too, like, if you were to spend a day with them that you would think they were good people because they are good people. Granted, you know, when you come home, you let your guard down. And unfortunately, it seems like we treat the people we love the most, the worst. But manners are a lost art. And I'm trying to teach my children that too. So if we're going into a building, they're holding the door. If someone doesn't hold the door, like if someone goes in and the door slams right behind them right before we get there, they will say, well, that's rude. Yeah, it's rude, but I, you know, we also have to realize we don't, you know, maybe that person had a bad day. Maybe they didn't realize we were behind them, but manners have kind of slipped away. And to go back to what you said about losing the art of conversation, you know, does that tie in together? If we don't have manners and we don't know even how to speak to someone, then I think it does. I think it goes hand in hand. And I think it's hard because it is with our with us, right? Because we are the ones who set the foundation. And when you said you're seeing 40, 50 year olds stuck in their devices, you're at the park, you're at the playground, you're at the mall and kids are playing and you've got mom and dad, you know, I'll never, I was, we were at one of those places at the mall. And this little boy, I mean, it's a very benign place, and but he climbed up on top of this slide and he thought it was cool. And he kept saying, dad, dad, look at me, dad. And the dad was just, the dad wouldn't even look at him. And I felt like my heart was curling because like this little boy is so excited, you know, there's that interaction with dad and dad's not even paying attention. So dad didn't even have the manners there. So, you know, now if my kid goes or that kid goes and pushes my kid, well, I don't know what kind of manners has he been taught. So I don't know, going off on a tangent, but well, you're not going off on a tangent. It's, it's, it is sad because that learned behavior, I'll use my own children as an example, you know, again, divorced dads raised my five kids. Um, You know, some of them were, weren't even teens yet. Some of them were teens and I got full custody of them. And I seen the different patterns of learned behavior from their other parent. So I'm not here to sit here and have a complaining session about her, but for her, it wasn't a device. It was a book, but I understood her childhood. She was one of 13 alcohol family and all this trauma. 
and she escaped inside of a book. So she'd be that person at the park, kids yelling, hey, mom, and she'd be, right? She might look up and smile. And it, it, when I finally got full custody of them, they were shocked because when I go to the park with them, even when I had joint, just joint custody of them, they knew that I'd always be present. I wouldn't be in a book. I wouldn't be looking at anything else. I'd be actually standing at the bottom of the slide, or I'd be on a swing with beside them and laughing and giggling. But in society, I think the negative always outweighs the positive. So that stuck with them. So when I finally got full custody of them, it took, it was like a, it was like a cleansing moment, having to cleanse them of the fact that you know, you're not going to have to go back to that. You don't have to, because I'd, I'd be saying, hey, you know, you're having fun? Huh? What? They would be shocked because they'd be asking them questions while they're playing. Hey, you want to do this? Because they were so conditioned by the negative. And I think society is, is really bad for that. We hold on to the negative. And even though we, you and I are talking about the past, I, I have hope. I have hope in, in our society and our future that there's a good enough people that we're teaching our children and you're younger than I am. And it's refreshing to know that you're having your kids at a standard, not such a standard though. Again, listeners don't think that we're, you know, sitting there like the military and making sure that they're specifically always following Sarah right. mentioned the fact they come home and you wonder if, did they leave that other kid there? <laughs> right. Did, <laughs> yeah. you, what happened? But we still have a standard that they must adhere to in a gray area because being a parent, there's no manuals. It wasn't a manual for me. There isn't a manual for you with your younger kids. All we can do is try our best, but role modeling matters to me and respect is huge. And like you mentioned, holding the door open. So you know, and the next thing I wanted to mention, you talked about, you know, going outside to the pool and you played and, you know, your fourth grade, amazing. And knowing you were going to win this championships and then you accomplished that. But you talked about the team spirit and the unity. Sports, though, is so overlooked as, as something that can teach people social skills. They can teach, you know, the fact of team to together, everybody achieves more. They teach the ability, obviously, again, as a side note, you have to have a good coach though. I've had some lousy coaches for myself yep. growing yep. up, I had some lousy coaches my kids had. So parents, don't be afraid to remove your kids from that circumstance because that learned behavior is damaging for them long-term. And if you sit back and allow it, they think it's okay too. So you need to protect your children as a side note for that. But sports is so key. And I was really pleased that you brought that up and the fact though that you were a dreamer already at four but the difference between dreams is you that was a goal for you so your dream can become a goal listeners and then Sarah put in the effort and the work like you said you play basketball every single day and then all of a sudden you win the championships and you're in high school in your senior year so you know is there anything else you want to key on in regards to sports? But I think it's so key that our kids are active and outside and not in front of their devices all the time and hanging around with mm -hmm. like-minded people that want to play sports too. Mm -hmm. I like what you said about sports, how it's a, how it's a team situation. And I think sometimes, unfortunately, sports gets a bad rap because everyone wants their kid to be the superstar. We're not all going to be the superstar. It's just no. not possible. We're not everyone is going to uh, rise to the top, but the team needs everyone. They don't need just superstars because if you had five superstars out on the court, I suppose that'd be great, but you need the people that show up every day that are consistent and it does teach you a lot. It teaches you respect and unity and um, patience. And when you were talking about being at the park with your children, I have to admit that sometimes Patience is difficult for me because I usually have a lot of things on my plate and it's very often that someone is texting me about work or something and so my kids are playing and I will answer it, but I will put it back, but to be present, you know, that's really cool that you said that you're being present because there's, there's something that most people have lost too. They're not present. No, you're out to supper with someone, you, you grab your phone. Yeah. yeah. And we can't be present. We can't even be present in our, with ourselves. 
you know, if we're by ourselves, you know, you get, yeah, exactly. let's say we're having coffee and someone gets up and goes to the bathroom. Usually someone's grabbing their phone right away. Really? Like, when did that be? It, it's just crazy to me. And I, I struggle with this too, but to just be able to be is kind of really just good for your mental health. Well, and it's something you have to work out your whole life. Like I tell people, people will say to me, oh, it must be nice to be like that. Well, I just didn't wake up one day and decide I'm going to be present. I've been working on this once I had the realization. And what exact age did I have that realization? Probably when my marriage fell apart, right? And that was a long time ago. So 20 some years ago, I realized that, you know, I'm worrying about all these things that are going on. My marriage is falling apart. I'm worrying about now that now that we're divorced, now I'm worrying about how am I going to pay for this? And I was, and I write about, I wrote, write about this in my book about living a life of quiet desperation and not knowing, you know, what was going on and how I'm going to deal with my next day. Well, when you're suffering from quiet desperation, depression, anxiety, you can't be present in what's going on around you. You can barely be no. present in yourself. Yeah. And it's one of the questions I'm going to ask you soon here. Because I can so appreciate the fact that, you know, anybody listening, I'm never here to judge you. I am a work in pro- project. I am going to work on myself the rest of my life to be present because there's no promise for tomorrow. Just like you and I talking right now, I need to have everything blocked out in my mindset, everything and be present just for Sarah, because mm-hmm. the listeners deserve that you deserve that. And I always have to remind myself, I deserve that to be present. And it's something we work on. I, I don't think it ever, I don't think it's ever a hundred percent habit that sticks. It's mm-hmm. easy for me to get distracted. As you mentioned, you could be at the park and need to answer a text. I'm not perfect. When I get together with people uh, and my kids know it too, uh, you know, I'll tell people, even clients, when I sit down, I'll say to them, especially when I was a single parent raising my kids and they're at home as teenagers, right? I'd say to them, you know what? My phone's going to be here. I will not answer it. I will not be texting. It'll be nothing. The only thing, reason that's going to be here is I'm a single dad, right? A lot of times they knew already are. I just remind them and I might have to take a phone call because otherwise they might kill each other. <laughs> Right. So I was just, I was just real with people that sometimes I can't be present or, you know, I'm in the middle of this and a text is coming in. Yes. Now, Sarah, you and I are sitting together, but prior to Sarah and I getting together, I had something going on that is still ongoing and it's going to be present in my mindset. I'm going to try really hard, but it might come in and I might have to deal with it, but I will be as present. So people, honesty, just be honest with people, right? You got something going on and I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I, I try really hard because I've been miss, miss, uh, what's the word, not abused, but I've been, I've been put in that position where people really haven't been present. And I feel like I'm talking to a wall and you've been there. I think we all have, and it's frustrating because we all want to be heard. We don't want to be just sat there and then somebody's listening to what we say or we think they do and all they're doing is waiting to respond that's another big problem with our society huge but i think you made a good point that you uh, that's why you have credibility because you can say working on it don't have all the answers and i do find that i find people much more credible when they can say i have a coach or i'm doing this to improve myself because if you have all the answers, you're usually not the most credible person because you're not, you're not working on yourself because you're already, you're already done. Right. Well, exactly. Like I look at some of my most famous uh, friends, we're talking extremely successful. They all still have coaches and mentors. I still have, I belong to two different masterminds. I belong to masterminds that help me with my speaking business. I belong to masterminds that help me with um, my actual business itself on on my thought processes my six inches between my ears I have mentors and coaches that I'm on calls with so listeners people watching if you ever want to continue to always be the best version of you you always have to realize that you've never arrived and if that may sound harsh but you've never you're never going to arrive you need to realize that somebody 
always might see the forest for the trees where you can't. And they can say, you know what, Dwight, you were talking to me about a conversation here and, and how somebody responded and you couldn't quite understand why they responded that way. I can. Would you like to hear it? And then you need to be receptive, right? So many people get butt hurt and they get, they get anxious. They get, and I'm telling you listeners, this doesn't happen overnight. Again, work and project. <laughs> I, I work on it every day. And on those moments when I slip backwards and I'm not in a climb mode and I'm camping, I learned to realize that because I have mentors and coaches and I realize that I need to forgive myself. I need to say to myself, I'm grateful that like I, this morning I do a great, I do a gratitude exercise every day. My faithful listeners know I do that. So when I get up in the morning, I'm grateful and I'll think to myself, I'm blessed to even have this problem. <laughs> right. I'm blessed to the fact that I have people that can help me through this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Forgive myself for getting into this circumstance and don't let it suck me down the rabbit hole again, because I've suffered from depression, anxiety, a lot of my life. I've had panic attacks. I know what it's like, but the better, yes, it's, it's debilitating for sure, but without working on it and having others help us be accountable because accountability isn't toward others. It's us and somebody yeah. helping yeah. us stay accountable to us, right? Yep. To remind us, Hey, Dwight, didn't you say that? Well, Okay. They're not judging you. They're just helping you be your, they're, they're like the co-pilot of your life. And the more co-pilots you can have, obviously that, you know, like, and trust, right. You gotta, you gotta assess people. I've had some terrible coaches. I don't know about you. I've had some mentors that were <laughs> batshit crazy. Questionable. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we'll, we'll move on from this topic, but you know, thank you so much for yeah, this has been a great conversation thus far. I can't wait for the rest. So Sarah, as a busy wife, mom of three and business owner, it is not difficult to see why you suffered from anxiety and eventually a panic attack. Now that this is in your rear view mirror somewhat, what did you learn that helps you manage all of life more effectively so it is less likely to happen again? I really just had to revamp all the things. So we decided to build a house as we were having a baby. And my husband has a very stressful job. So he was either working on the house or working and I'm pregnant and trying to run two clinics and just the stress of everyone needing to, you know, eat healthy and everyone needing to, you know, me having to be who I thought I should be. And the pressure and the time, I, it was just too much. And so looking back, I had had anxiety. I should really start from here. I had had anxiety in high school to the point where um, I, did, I was not put on medication, but I went and saw a counselor and someone local. I don't know how, because I was not sharing this at the time. Um, but they knew I was seeing a counselor <clears throat> and someone had asked a family member of mine, is Sarah still crazy? Um, and I remember hearing that and I was like, hmm, like, I'm not crazy. I, there's just, you know, I was only 17. Like, should 17 year olds have that much stress? I don't know. But apparently I had put it upon myself or felt like other words. I mean, it doesn't matter where it came from. It was there. Talked myself through it with a counselor moved on with life. Again, I suppose when I was 20, um, I was medicated at that time. I was working at a job. My boss was in a different town. My parents were at the lake and apparently it was just too overwhelming for me. Okay. So they put me on medication, made me a zombie. Okay. So I knew that I didn't want to, I felt like I was going through the motions and no, I wasn't crying every day. But it was to the point where, and if, if anyone has had anxiety or depression, you know that you don't even know what's bothering you. So I would go to my brother's house, him and his wife, and I would sit on the couch and cry. I didn't know why I was crying. I didn't really want to be with them because I felt like I shouldn't. And it was my brother and his wife. I mean, you can't, under, you can't even explain what you're thinking to someone who's not had these feelings because maybe it does sound crazy. So got through that stopped taking the medication, didn't want to do that, and was fine for quite a while. Now looking back, you know, when you were a single dad, 
you just go through the motions, right? Like you just do what you got to do because it's got to be done and you know you got to do it. And I was going through all those motions, but at the same time, the stress of everything just got to be too much. So looking back, there's probably some signs I probably could have said, oh yeah, you know, probably should have pulled it back a little then. But in my mind, I had gone to school for so long, so I needed to make you know, I had, had to make this big impression and I needed to help as many people as I could. And I put myself on the back burner. I wasn't helping myself at all. There was no self-care and self-care isn't getting a pedicure or getting your hair cut. You know, maybe it's reading a book by yourself or having some time by yourself, but there's another thing that people have lost self-care. So is that why stress and anxiety are so bad? I, I don't possibly, but after the panic attack, so I thought I was having a stroke because I had not had anything like that before. Husband calls the ambulance, all this stuff. Um, and then the doctor says, um, I think you're having a panic attack. And I'm thinking, way more serious than a panic attack, sir. Like I, you know, I have this headache and I, my arm feels wet and um, no, it was a panic attack. There was nothing wrong. So my husband, as much as he doesn't like remembering this, He's crying because I'm, you know, what's he going to do? Really? He's got two little kids and here's his wife having a panic attack. And they brought me a list of like five medications they wanted me to take. And I looked at the list and then I said, I'm not going to take any of these. And my husband says, we can't do this again. And I said, something else is wrong. Like I have to fix the problem because this is a band-aid. I said, I can take these, but then what? And so I am not encouraging anyone to not take medication. I am not encouraging you to stop taking your medication. I am encouraging you to dig deep within you and find out what's best for you. I knew there was a problem, Dwight. I had already had a little anxiety here, a little there. It was peppered throughout my life. So what am I going to do? Let's mask it and then stop the medication. And it's going to come back when I'm 45. No, let's find out what the problem was. And so I did. And that's when I got into more functional medicine and I got some different mentors and I found out what could be causing this and what I needed to work on for myself. And I changed it. Does that mean I don't have any stress or anxiety? No. This summer, one of my best friends, her 40th birthday party, I did not go because for whatever reason that week, I don't know if I had seen someone that reminded me of my dad, but something clicked that week. And I had a lot of anxiety and I just knew going to a big party with a lot of people was going to make me feel uncomfortable just to have a lot of little conversations. I was just going to, you know, I was going to be like that little Pomeranian, like, okay, what's, you know, who are we going to yeah. talk to next? I didn't want to feel yeah. that way. Of course but now, not. now I can remove myself from those situations. And I apologize to her. I couldn't tell her that day. Later, I sent her a face message. I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I, it was not you. I did not mean to disrespect you. I, for my mental health, I literally couldn't come. And I think when you've dealt with stuff like that, you don't take that stuff personally. You know, like if someone doesn't come to my birthday party, okay. I don't, I don't think it's because you don't like me, but if, if someone tells me I just needed my own time, I really respect that because a lot of times we don't take that time. We just push, 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 push until we get in these situations we really don't want to be in. And that was my case. So I closed the clinic that I had in mind on and I just, I work a mile from my home now. Um, and it's a lot better for me because I'm not running, 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 running. And I had to set boundaries. But when you don't have boundaries, you know, when you're starting a new business and when you have clients, you want to see them any time, right? So, oh yes, I'll meet you after hours and I'll work through my lunch and oh, I'll come early. And I was doing that. But the funny thing is, and with all due respect to everyone, but are they doing that for me? You know, oh, I'm sorry, dentist. I can't come in until 545. So can you just clean my teeth then? I would never ask a dentist to do that. Oh, grocery store. I know you close at seven. I'm not going to make it there till 705. You know, I wouldn't put people out like that. So in a way, I don't know if I was bending over backwards to prove to myself I could do this business or if I was trying to please everyone. But at the end of the day, I wasn't pleasing myself. 
And yeah, I'm adjusting someone or seeing someone at six o'clock at night, but at to what cost? When does it end? Well, people pleasing and boundaries don't equate, right? They just at all. I've been a people pleaser most of my life, and I can totally understand, you know, like you talked about self care, you talked about the fact of medications. And again, I'm not telling people they shouldn't be medicated either. I've, I've tried medications. And when I was younger, had that zombie feeling like you're talking about, and I've had that where I wanted to people please absolutely everybody, especially as a single dad, it was really tough because I felt like I had to prove to everybody that I was worthy of being a single parent, that I could do it as well as you know, a single mom or, or a husband and wife yeah. being together. And I'd have those pleasing everybody. And I was again, back to what I, I talk about a lot. And when I, when I coach and I wrote about in my book, which was really hard about the fact of living in quiet desperation and literally leaving my room, coming downstairs and having a facade. I lived a facade. I lived that life of, Oh, everything's rosy. And then there was the odd person that could see through my layer of crap, right? And they'd say to me, you know, you're not fine. Who are you kidding? Well, guess who I avoided? Those people. Because I wasn't ready to hear the truth, right? And bottom line, I needed to find, as you mentioned, I need to find it. I needed to figure out, like you said to your husband, I need to figure out, and you said to the medical professionals, I need to figure out exactly what's going on. What's the root of all this? And for some people, it's harder than that. And they need some medication. I get it. But I look at because there is people that I have in my life that are clinically depressed and they have been on medication their, their whole life. And there's others that with work like you and I put in, you get to a point where you can get away with not using medication. Sometimes it's just that, as you talked about self-care, not being a pedicure, right? Or a massage. It's self-care is boundaries and making sure that we're reading a good book, listening to a good podcast. And I, and I coach people all the time on that, associations. And they'll say, well, the people I hang out are, with aren't the issue. Well, you're getting it all wrong. Associations and self-care are, what are you putting into your brain? <laughs> what are you yes. reading? What are you watching? When you're depressed, are you listening to depressing music, watching depressing television shows, hanging out with depressing friends that just feed what you're feeling? Or are you looking to hang out with people that are are elevated, that are climbing, because that's where you want to be? So listeners, you need to figure out, like Sarah is saying, and is it a slow process? It can be baby steps. It can be weeks, months, years. Just find somebody that can help you. Talk to somebody. There's nothing wrong and you mentioned, you know, somebody mentioned about the fact is Sarah still crazy. Well, I've mm-hmm. had that sort of comments from people. Those are the people that I disassociate with, even if it's family or friends. And as you mentioned, I love how you talked about your friend's 40th party. Listeners, if you didn't catch that, she said, no, that's okay. That is self-care. Or I get to a point where I, there's a family gathering and people want me to go and I don't necessarily like all the energy I know that's going to be there. And I'm in a good place, but I know if I go to that event, I'm not going to be in a good place. So I tell, I coach people, well, how do you get around that, Dwight? Well, supper's at five. I show up at 4.30. <laughs> show like a half hour before I'm eating at, at, at a f- relatives or friends or whatever. Yeah. And supper's over at six o'clock, let's say, 6.30, I'm gone. And, and I'm very polite and listeners listen to this. It's okay to say to people when they go, well, what's going on? What do you got going on? Oh, I'm busy. I got some things to deal with. Guess what? I'm never lying because that thing that I'm dealing with or that I'm going to be busy with is my self-care and that's okay. So I'm not lying to them. I'm being honest with them. I'm busy. I got some things to take care of. And that thing I'm taking care of is me. So I, I limit and if I can, I'll avoid, but sometimes you just can't, you have to be at a certain event and it's okay. Right. I love what Sarah said. It's okay. You know, and just reach out to that person after and just say, Hey, and if they really care and love for you, they're, they'll be okay that's with right. you saying that, you know, I, I just couldn't cope right at that moment. And that's right. how Sarah is going to continue to climb in life and be the best person possible version of herself for her husband and her kids. So kudos to you. Thank you for sharing and being vulnerable about that. I really appreciate it. 
Mm -hmm. And when I really like how you say if I'm if you're camping or climbing, because I like to say when I feel like I've plateaued and and I like I really like how you said that. So I'm going to use that um, in the future. When I feel like I've plateaued, then I think that is a stressful thing for me. So or when I'm camping, I like that. And when we were talking about people and relationships, it's sad to me when someone is trying to grow themselves or find peace for themselves for whatever reason and other people just can't have it. You know, like when someone's trying to lose weight and you have your friends that are sabotaging you, you know, bringing you Mountain Dew or bringing you cookies and it's like, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on a diet. People sometimes just cannot respect your boundaries. And when you're trying to be a better version of yourself, what bothers me is when people will have friends or family who are so insecure that when one person is trying to better themselves, they take it personally and, and they want to sabotage it because I don't know if they're afraid that the relationship is going to fail, but it's like, if I'm trying to get better for me, I'm not trying to be better than you. I'm trying to be better than the old me. And obviously you and I get that because we see people who want to change in change is constant, right? The only thing constant really is change because something is always changing. So if we're not changing and we're staying the same person that we've been is, you know, are we really doing ourselves justice? I don't think so. So I'm not telling anyone to cut people out of your life, but sometimes you do have to minimize how much you're with people who might be criticizing you for trying to change. Obviously, if you have an addictive behavior and your family members are doing an intervention, that is not the same thing. But if you're taking a creative writing course and you started a blog or a podcast, you know, like all these random things that I started to do, I had a lot of people ask me, what are you doing? What do you think you are? Why? This is what I want to do. I love doing a podcast because I love talking to people. So that's the cool thing about technology, because here we are. We never would have met. I have great conversations with people I never would have met. So I love having conversations with people. I like randomly doing a blog. I like being a chiropractor. I like doing a bunch of different things. So I'm just trying to do different things to make me better. So I want people to find something that they enjoy that would make them better and find people who want you to be better. If people don't want you to be better, I don't know. Well, it's, <laughs> it's okay to cut those people out of your life though. Like, you know, there is people in my life that, again, I do, like I told you, I, I limit the, the conversation or contact with them, even on the phone. I've gotten very good at saying, you know, I got to go. I got an appointment. I ain't lying. That appointment was, is with me and my sanity. <laughs> it's not staying on the phone call with somebody that is literally bringing me down, that they're energy vampires. And you mentioned about the fact that I use <laughs> camping versus climbing. Well, it's, it's, it's true that. because in life I've been camped so many times and the associations I have are keeping me camped because like you said, they, you know, you're on a, an attritional lifestyle journey or you're on a diet, whatever you want to call it. And they bring you cookies. They bring you things that they know they shouldn't and their intentions can be well-meaning, but if after you explain to them a few times and they continue to do it, most times it's because that person is stuck they're camped. They don't like the fact that you're climbing. It makes them uncomfortable. So they'd rather yes. be, they, they become your boat anchor. They become, yes. you know, it's a, it's a invisible strap that's on your shoulder pulling you back. So, you know, I have no problems. I've gotten to a point in my life where that person, I look at them and evaluate them. So listeners, I evaluate people and I say to myself, they were good for me at this period in time in my life. Maybe I did need somebody to commiserate with and I was camped and now I'm not that person anymore and that person hasn't changed and I'm changing and I don't need that boat anchor I don't need that person to to sabotage my climb right and don't get me wrong climbing I still have moments where I temporarily camp right but it's yeah. very short-lived because I've become somebody that is always wanting to level up that's always wanting to continue to climb because and it's and i used to use everybody else as a reason why i needed to climb uh-uh i'm good enough 
I'm good enough reason to want to climb. And because I realize that I'm good enough and that I'm important enough, I've, my health has gotten better. It it just, it gets to a point where I don't need to, because why do addictions happen, Sarah, so much in society? People self-medicate. So whether it's a doctor giving you a prescription or you're, you're having a glass of wine or a, a, a whiskey or whatever every single night, or you're somebody that smokes up or whatever, if you do any of that moderation, fine, right? But if you're somebody that has to do it every single day, you're masking something yeah. because life, life can be enjoyed sober. It really can, listeners, Absolutely. you do not think that. I've been in those circumstances where I talked about the, you know, people self-medicating haven't been for like 20 years, but I've been in those circumstances, hung out with the people that were commiserating, making me feel what I thought I needed or having that drink or whatever the case may be. But it is so it's, I don't even know how to put it. It is just so fulfilling of your life to get to a point where it's about you and you don't have to apologize for it being about you. Yeah, that's well, that's very well put. And it's nice when you're happy within yourself and you're not comparing what you do or do not have. And that's different than having a coach or a mentor or wanting to be fit like someone or whatever. But when you get in the small small mind thinking of so-and-so has that car or so-and-so does this or does that. It's not what we're here for. We're not here for other people. We're here for ourselves and we need to, we need to make peace with who that is. And again, you just, you're proving your credibility again. I mean, if you've been at the bottom and you got yourself out, it can be done. Oh yeah. And you know, people that are listening, I'm not ever going to tell you it was easy, but it is so rewarding, right? It's just like anything. You just have to, you have to look at the end result of what you want, not get so focused on all the processes. You have to have processes to get out of, you know, the valley of despair or in that rabbit hole, but people focus and going, oh, that's going to be painful. Oh, that's going to hurt. That, of course. You know what? I'm not saying it's not going to, but it's part of the journey of self-discovery and healing. And it is, Sarah and I can tell you, it's so worth it. And, you know, reach out to either of us, find somebody that you can, you can talk to that can help you figure out why you're camped. And again, I'm not, I'm not a professional. So if it's bad enough and I have a conversation with somebody, I'll tell them, you know what? I can't help you. I can listen mm-hmm. to you. I can give you some pointers, but you need mm-hmm. to seek out professional help, yes. right? And there's nothing wrong with that either. No, because no one should be expected to do any of this alone. I have gone through a lot of therapy and every now and then I've, I, in generally in my life, all is good. But every now and then I'll think, I just need a little tune up. And so I'll go in and maybe nothing is earth shattering, but I just kind of get a check-in, you know, why do we get our teeth cleaned every six months? Well, we're being proactive. I'm a huge advocate to be proactive in your health, because if you wait until you're in the emergency room with a panic attack, well, now we got to be reactive and we got to figure out, you know, it's more of a puzzle, but if you're proactive, I just, it bothers me the stigma that people have put on mental health because- absolutely. I I just don't understand when we were supposed to do everything alone. Like when were we just supposed to be so strong and not need help? It's just, that's not the way we were really made, right? We were made to help each other. And I mean, I'm not going to go into a, oh, we shouldn't judge people because people are going to judge no matter what, but we're not meant to do this alone. We aren't. Well, look, it's that, it's the pack mentality. It's the teamwork mentality. We need to support one another you know, animals in the wild support one another. They're, they're in packs. They protect one another. They nurture one another. And yep. we, as societies think that we have to be strong. We have to be brave. And I was one of those people, like I said, I live in quiet desperation. I'd leave my room. All of a sudden I'd be like this in my room and I'd leave my room and I have a big smile on my face and hi kids. How's it going? And talk to my clients. Oh yeah. 
how's it going to it? Oh, things are fantastic. When inside I was dying. <laughs> it was just like And the Oscar goes too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. It, it, it's as long as nobody's slapping me. And some of you might know what I mean by that. What happened at the Oscars <laughs> the last couple of days. Yeah. As long as I'm not getting slapped, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so find find people if it's a if it's a professional, cool. If it's some friends, cool. If you find you know, you know your podcast, you are encouraging people to dig within themselves. My podcast, I encourage people to do better, be better, live better, because I truly want people to live their best life. And if I can help them do that, that's cool. I might not be able to help you. So why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? You aren't going to be able to reach everyone. I'm not going to be able to reach everyone. But the more we have conversations, the more people we possibly can reach. And maybe they will go get help. Or maybe they'll walk out on a bad friendship. I don't know, but maybe their life will be better. And that's what we're supposed to do is help each other be better. Well, network, because like yes. doing the podcast, somebody might like me, but yet they don't feel comfortable with myself. They're listening to this podcast or they're watching it and they see how, uh, you know, Sarah with your body language, now they can, uh, you know, take your tonality and your body language and put them together. They feel comfortable with you and they reach out to you and they get help. The end result's still the same. It's not yep. about me. It's about me wanting to help others. And it's the same for yourself. So we just need to continue to realize that the larger our networks get, aka the podcast or with my yep. book, right? Giving people like my book on the wall, they're giving people a sense of connection and realizing that hey, holy crap, did he go through a lot? Because my whole book's about my origin, right up to where I am today, right? So 150 pages of telling people things that I hadn't told anybody, right? Why did I, I do why did, that? Why did they do that? Well, because I wanted people to realize that, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Like literally, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've lived through this. I've, and I continue to have those moments and I just continually network and surround myself with people that are uplifting. And I have no problems of saying, you know what, Sarah, you're a great person. You were good for me at a point in my life. I might not say that to you, but I, I, I analyze that and I'll say to myself, Sarah was so such a blessing in my life at that point. But now I've, I'm climbing and Sarah still camped. And I also use the bicycle analogy, right? Riding with people on a bike. Right. I've coached on this lots and Sarah's on one side, uh, you know, Jim's on the other and we're, we're pedaling. All of a sudden I look over and Jim's falling back a little bit. That's okay. Jim's falling back. That's okay. Jim's, you know, I'm continuing to climb. Jim's decided to slow down. He's going to maybe eventually camp. We're not in the same phase anymore, but Jim had a place in my life. Originally he was pedaling mm -hmm. with me. Sarah's still with me. Hey, Sarah, how you doing? <laughs> Fantastic. You're still pedaling with me. We're, we're, you know, rock stars. We're rooting for one another. We're there for those self-correcting moments where we help each other so we can not stay camped and start climbing again. So Sarah might back up a little bit, or I might back up again a little bit and we're biking with one another and Sarah's going, come on, catch up Dwight. You're better than that. You can do it. I believe in you, or I'm doing the same to you. That's the people we need in our lives. Right. Yes. So, so Sarah, as a doctor of chiropractic and wellness advocate, you have helped thousands of others get back on their feet the same way you did for yourself. Can you step the listeners and I through your process of teaching better nutrition, cleaner products, and then mastering the mindset? So obviously I do adjusting, but there's more to chiropractic than that. So a lot of times if we clean up a diet, get rid of some processed food, a lot of times we're not getting the nutrients we need in our diet. So sometimes we need to add different supplements. <clears throat> I'm, I, I do think that life can be like a roller coaster. So, you know, our stress level can be like this and, and we need to respect where people are. So if people are on one supplement for, you know, 15 years, I mean, is that really doing much? So I think a lot of times people are watching a TV show and they will see a doctor say, this is good for that. And then all of a sudden I have that, I need this. And so they'll rush out to Dollar General or Target. 
and they'll buy these subpar supplements and they probably aren't getting much of actual help, but they think that they're getting help. So I like to try to take out the mystery of it. And I don't like when people waste money. So I will say, if you were buying your vitamins for two, three, five dollars a bottle, it's probably not good quality. And I literally would just rather you not take it because if it's not good quality, is it actually harming you? Like fish oil, I'm a big fish oil person. It's very good for many things. But if you don't buy high quality fish oil, it could have plastic in it, or it could actually do more harm than good. So sometimes it's better not to take these things. And people don't know, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So if you are listening to the doctor on TV say, you need this for that, and you have that, and you think you need this, there's another thing. You just you need someone to personalize what you need, and what you need and what I need are going to be different and because we're different and so I, I just try to break it down for the person we do a lot of detoxing i i do like um i do like different energy work it depends on the person i do like massage i do like to try to incorporate spiritual emotional physical health because we need to we need to look at you as a whole and not just uh, yourself i recently had to have elbow surgery so i haven't been able to adjust since february and so I started a weight loss clinic and I'd been against it for years. My husband has told me for years, you should do a weight loss clinic. No, no, I'm not going to be responsible for other people's weight. No, this is on them. And it, it was just kind of really good timing. And I found this really respectable program. And so I started that and I thought I probably wouldn't have done that had I not hurt my elbow because I probably wasn't going to have time to do that. So now I can help people make better choices, reduce inflammation, increase their energy. And I get excited, you know, it's, it's fun when you can hear people say, oh, they can play with their grandkids or in my world, I like hearing people who will, will say, I'm pooping every day instead of I'm pooping once a week, you know? Yeah, like, perfect, that's good. Yeah, Bob movements are important, absolutely. They are, and absolutely. so many people don't have them. So it's these little things and it's not always like, just this huge monumental thing. But sometimes too, it's just that they're happy that someone cares because you go, sometimes you're just kind of rushed in and you're rushed out like cattle and they're waiting to talk like you alluded to before. They're waiting to tell you what's wrong with you. No, no, you tell me what's wrong with you because you know you better than I know you, right? The amount of people who come in and cry because I just don't feel good and I've been to the doctor and they said, I'm fine, but I know I'm not fine. You know, where there's the art of listening, you know, oh, that's, and that's a dying art though, unfortunately. It is. And I don't want to say, I just love working with those people because I love working with anyone, but I had one person one time say, I guess this is about as good as it's going to get. And I said, no, this isn't as good as it's going to get. Let's find out what else you need. And again, that might not be me. But I'm secure enough to know I'm not going to heal everyone, but I can help anyone. So I just really try to look at the person and what the person needs and what their goals are, because our goals are going to be different. You know, I ride, I like to ride my bike and I had surgery. So I probably need something to help heal and whatever. You know, maybe you are really struggling to get out of bed in the morning. Okay, what, what's going on with your adrenals? We're all different. We have to be treated as different we're not in the same box. So I just try to give each patient their own voice, really. Well, yeah, because you, for the last thing you just mentioned, you're not sleeping well. Well, you listen to people and I'll, <clears throat> I have conversations with different people and I, and I have this designation in my country called Elder Planning Council. And as designation isn't about finance or planning, it's about being a good listener and listening to people in all aspects of their life from their spirituality to their health to their finances and i'll just talk to them and they'll say they're not sleeping well and and i notice they're drinking coffee and it's seven o'clock at night and i'll say to them or you know you drink a lot of coffee yeah i do um you know i don't know if this can help you but I found that after a certain time of the day if I drink any caffeine after about three o'clock in the day it takes they've medically found that it takes six to eight hours for caffeine to leave your brain so even if you are able to fall asleep and you've had a coffee at seven o'clock and you're going to bed at 10 
your brain's still a racing and you know, just food for thought. I just keep it really general. Right. And if they say, Oh, I'd love to know more. Well, then we have that conversation. Right. And I'll direct them or I'll find information or I can send them to people, but that's just a simple example that I'm giving caffeine really messes up a lot of people's sleep patterns. I have clients that are telling me, well, yeah, I don't sleep well. I got to take a sleeping pill every single night. And it's, they're masking the things that are causing them not to be sleeping properly. Then they wake up with a sleep hangover. Cause I talk to them, how do you, when you, how do you feel the next day? And I say, and the only reason I ask them is because I've, had sleeping medication 20 years ago and I know how it made me feel and I never got to the root of what the issue is so maybe that's your problem maybe you need to get to the root of it people listening maybe it's anxiety that's causing you to do it you're living in like I lived in quiet desperation and or you know living through circumstances like Sarah has you need to find the root of what's causing your problems so that you can sleep properly. Um, you know, like, and I love how you put the fact that you went from elbow surgery to creating a weight loss clinic, right? It's like things happen to us, right? They happen for us, not to us. Part of me, they, they happen things it depends how we look at life and you looked at it the right way. Time to pivot time to add things, even though you were resistant to it at first, now you're enjoying it for years. And I will tell people that whenever they're working with me and I told all my weight loss people this last week, we're traveling together. I'm holding the map and you're driving the car. I can tell you what we should do, but you're driving the car. So you are in control. So if you lose a bunch of weight, that's because you put in the effort. If you didn't lose a bunch of weight, it's because you put in the effort. So I didn't want to like, you know, you know, this is not my problem. No, but we have to know that we are accountable for our own health. Like you can lead a horse to water. Yeah, exactly. So, You're a co-pilot and that's exactly a what, a, that's exactly what we are in life as we coach. And there's a difference between coach and mentorship listeners, but we won't get into that today. They mm -hmm. both have their place. Somebody mm -hmm. can be both. I do both. It all depends what a person needs. But I'm a co-pilot. And as I like how you put that, they're ultimately responsible for their result. Yep. All I can do is hope that they're sincere, that they're honest with me, so that and, and they're up to um, positive criticism, because it is people can dress up the word however they want. But when I'm being critical with somebody, I'm being putting a positive slant on it. Say, when they tell me stuff, whether it's in their health or it's their finances. And I'll say, well, did you do this? Or did you do that? Have you tried this? Sometimes people are going to be resistant at first because nobody wants to be under a microscope. They take it personal and it, it can take time. Some people just jump right on the ship and they're just wanting you to co-pilot with them and they, and they follow everything. I find that, yep. I, don't, I find that not very often, <laughs> right? Nope. I find, I find that it's a journey for a lot of people. And I'm okay with that because it's still a journey for me, right? So yes. I love I love your responses. And it, it just the fact that trash, you talked about trash supplements, you know, processed food. I've been personally, my listeners know I've been I've been following a proper, I will say that again, a proper ketosis lifestyle for four and a half years Ooh. already, right? And I do intermittent fasting as well. So I I prior to starting ketosis, I had cut out sugar in my life because I have and gluten and stuff because I had kids with health issues triggering you know four daughters and a son daughters that were triggered by gluten that made their cramps really bad um triggered dairy would trigger anxiety attacks for one of my daughters it was hard unbelievable like, like when I started doing elimination diets to figure out as they were growing up what was causing their health issues um but bottom line, I just keep on striving to be the best version of me. I'm not saying ket ketosis or keto diet is for everybody. It's worked for me. It's four and a half years. For me, it's not a diet, though. For me, something like that you're consistent with and you figure out how to intermittent fast and, and cut out processed foods and track your macros. For me, that is a lifestyle. That is Absolutely. my nutritional lifestyle. I'm not dieting like most people do to lose 15 pounds so I can go to Mexico and gain it. 
back and then gain and it then back. Gain. I yeah, I like that you said that because that's how a lot of people do it. They lose weight for the vacation, and then they gain it back, and that's not good for our body. No, and I'm not saying that, listeners. You're thinking to yourself, "Well, I'm not going all the way to this place and not enjoying some of the cultural foods." You exactly. can do that. Yeah, you can do that, but. Like when I went to Greece for two weeks in 2019, I went to Greece and I don't normally eat bread. Well, you go to Greece, you go to the Mediterranean diet is a lot of, you know, oils, vinegars, fresh bread. Absolutely. Once a day when we were sitting down and they bring it out about, I, I was having a piece. I'm not going to torture myself and have like six, seven pieces because then I know I'm going to wake up the next day with a food hangover. <laughs> I'm not into that. But when in Rome, Dwight, yes. when in Rome. Yes. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the fact that they bring out desserts at every meal. You don't order desserts. They bring out stuff for you depending on the restaurant. Cause I hung out at four different places in, in Greece on three different islands. But life is life's not about living, living, living so strict that you don't, you know, peek over the fence that you don't look and say, Oh, you know, what's over there. No, I want to experience that. Right. So I am so appreciating this conversation. So, um, one of the last things I was gonna, um, so anxiety is worrying about the future. What had you worrying that caused you to suffer from anxiety and eventually suffering from a panic attack? You answered that question, but do you agree that anxiety is more triggered toward our future? Like, and for me, the future can be an hour from now. I can be having anxiety about something happening an hour from now. What is your Absolutely. thoughts and takes about anxiety? I think anxiety for me, um, it's, it was all the little things that needed to be done now in two hours, in two days, there was always going to be something, right? Like something always had to be done. And I, I do think that it has a lot to do with the future and not necessarily in one year or, you know, it could be the, the near future. I just, I do think that we spend a lot of time worrying about things or thinking about things or situations that may or may not happen. And I think that will cause anxiety for people because we try to play out scenarios in our head and then we start to really think about it when sometimes we just overanalyze absolutely everything. And when you and I, before we started the podcast, I said, you know, I didn't necessarily prep for anything. And you said, no, that's good. So, you know, some people would stress about that. They would stress, I mean, you did a lot of preparation because you came with all your questions, but you know, some people have anxiety just for having a conversation like this, because what are we going to talk about? And what are we going to talk about for that long? And what if I don't know the answer? And sometimes we just get in our own heads and we cause anxiety where we don't need it because we don't need to overanalyze everything. And we just need to be and do and live and not worry not worry about the conversation we're going to have. Not worry about what are we going to have for supper? We know we're going to have supper. Like, is it really going to be upsetting? I forgot to take meat out. Do you know people like that? I didn't oh, take meat absolutely. out. And I don't know what we're going to have for supper. Oh, they melt. Okay. They have a meltdown. I know they people like meltdown. that. Yeah, they have a meltdown because they've never learned to just, oh, well, okay. Right. I guess we're, I I guess we're making pasta tonight. Yes, and do you think that's maybe what causes some people stress and anxiety? That we've come to the point where you had mentioned earlier about your own personal journey. You know, everyone has their own process. So you you can't, we can't decide what the process is going to be to heal, right? I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to have a panic attack. I'm not going to do medication. going to have some therapy. I'm going to close. No, I did not sit and think. I was just like, I need to just do this. So I just started. Sometimes I think we overanalyze and we try to outline everything that needs to happen. And then that just causes anxiety and stress too. We need some structure. We, we're, we have supper between 5.30 and 6.30. Okay. Well, if we have it at 5.25, then everyone should be happy, right? I think sometimes we just almost set unrealistic expectations, especially as parents, because a lot of times, oh, now so-and-so has practice and we have a concert and 
you have to be fluid. And if you're not fluid and if you're really rigid, I think that causes anxiety. But then I hear people will say to me, but if I don't have it all planned out, that causes me anxiety. Then you're probably always going to have anxiety because, you know, everything changes. Like I'm looking at my planner. I have things going on all day, but guess what? If something happens, I'm going to have, I'm going to adapt to the situation. There was a time that adapting would have been very difficult for me to do. So um, I do think anxiety has a lot to do with the future, even if it's talking about supper. Oh, absolutely. It can be, it can be 20 minutes after we're done this conversation. I can be thinking to myself, what are this, what about this? And it's something I have to practice just not to worry. Right. And because really worry is I tell people I used to be the biggest worry work. And once you get to a point where you realize worry is just making you suffer twice and they'll think, well, what do you mean suffer twice? Well, I worry up to that point of let's say, will you suffer? I worry about the fact, what are they going to be happy? Oh no, I forgot to take out meat and blah, 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 blah. And then I get to a point where it's supper and they do care. So then I'm worrying, how am I going to please them? How am I going to fix the circumstance? So I've suffered twice. Or if they don't care, I just wasted that prior part of my life that I could never get back wondering you know what this is what's for supper most people if you if you put unrealistic expectations on people that they expect you to always have everything planned out it's way too much pressure on yourself and then they have expectations unrealistic expectations of yourself and that's not fair either so again listeners it's not something that happens overnight like Sarah said it takes takes effort it takes time and so don't be so hard on yourself, reach out to one of us or reach out to whoever. And, you know, it's okay to say, Hey, I need some help. I'm stuck. Yes. Right? That's the start. So Sarah, if you had to give our listeners one last closing message, what would you tell them in regards to giving a heck and never giving up? I think you should find something that you enjoy. And whether it be something that you think you might enjoy or you have enjoyed in the past and you gave it up, I think you should give a heck about it and give a heck about yourself and try to incorporate it. Maybe you've always wanted to take a ceramics class. Maybe you want to do a painting class. Maybe you used to paint or do ceramics and you let it go. That could be your self-care. I think you need to give a heck more about yourself and your happiness because if you aren't happy, you're not giving your best version to the people around you and that's going to cause stress and anxiety for people around you. Yeah. And it affects not just the people around you. It's back to what we talked about. It affects your sleeping patterns. Yes. It, it affects us with addictive personality. If you have an addictive personality, because some people do, and some people it's just, they've, they've witnessed it their whole life. Yeah. It's a ripple. So all of a sudden when things get tough, they get addicted to, and it's not just drugs and alcohol. People have addiction issues to television. They have addiction issues to food. They have addiction issues to so many different things. We just need to be kind to ourselves, Like you said, self-care, look at your life. What made you happy in the past? If you quit that, go try it again. And if you try it again and realize, ah, back then I liked it and now I don't, that's okay. That's it's okay. a process. Life's a process. Right? And be okay proactive. To, yes. Do something for yourself instead of, you know, that you want to do something for yourself instead of when you have to do something for yourself. Exactly. So I so appreciate that. So our time is almost up and I want to respect our listeners in your time. However, before we end, can you please tell the listeners what's the best way to reach you? I can be reached. Uh, I have a website, purelysarahjane.com. And that has links to my blog and my podcast. I also, like I said earlier, I'm a huge um, advocate for healthy or good quality vitamins. There's a link to that. I also am very non-toxic, like non-toxic products, skincare, hair care. So all of that stuff that I really like is all on my website. You can contact me on there anytime. Um, All the information that you would probably need and some you don't would be on that website. <laughs> right on. Well, I've checked out your website. It's it, it, you're right. It's very informative. I'll make sure that goes into the show notes. Listeners, you can reach the show notes for this episode at giveaheck.com. Go into the podcast portal. 
uh, find Sarah's shining, beautiful face and click on it and you'll be able to read the show notes and find out how to reach out to her. So thanks so much for being on Give a Heck, Sarah. I so appreciate your time and sharing some of your experiences so that others too can learn it is never too late to give a heck. Thank you for taking time out of your day and listening to Give a Heck. If you find value, I'd appreciate you sharing with your friends and family so they too can learn how to live life on purpose, not by accident. So you do not miss the next episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and please also post a review. I look forward to reading your comments. This has been Dwight Heck. If you want to check out other podcast episodes or today's show notes, please check out my website, giveaheck.com. And until next time, together let us all strive to give a heck.